Morgy, what is this place? Luge Central, mate. Roto Vegas. What's Roto Vegas, dude? Roto Vegas. Roto Vegas. Morgy. Ah! <laughs> We're in Roto Rua, and it's fun time. Luges. Luges. Oh, I can't lie. I ain't that kind of guy. Girl, you put a spell on me. That's the reason why. No matter what I do, I can't stop. Greatest thing I've ever done in my life. Life changing. food are a major part of New Zealand today. That looks so good. Or as the Maori call it, Aotearoa. This is Maori land. The first Europeans settled here in the 1800s, but the Maori were here at least 500 years before that. One of the reasons Maori culture has remained so vibrant is that besides being great artists, they're also fierce hunters and warriors. The English never wanted to f with them, and so they've stood strong in the face of 200 years of colonization. You don't f Maoris. <laughs> but that doesn't mean their culture hasn't been impacted. The Maori diet from 500 years ago is not the same as today. With Morgan as my guide, I'm pumped to learn about Maori foods, cooking techniques, and culture. And I'm interested to see how colonization has affected some of their most traditional experiences. I met up with Morgan at Auntie's Garden to collect ingredients for the hungi. Morgi! A traditional Maori feast where food is cooked in the ground by burying it over hot stones. Welcome to my hometown. Hawks it's Bay. incredible. Hawks Bay. Yeah, I grew up here, man. So New Zealand. We're just here at Auntie's farm, and we're going to do a uh, hangi today with my family. So. Okay. Is that where you bury it in the ground? Yeah, so traditionally, we'll bury it in the ground. We'll dig up a hole, burn some wood down over right. some coals and some uh, rocks. But unfortunately, there's a fire ban on. So we're going to do it another sort of another style. So we won't do the traditional way? No, the traditional way, but we're going to do we're it We're still going to have a hangi. You know, we're still getting the vegetables from the earth. Yeah. You know, we're sharing it with each other. Foraging. Auntie is doing God's work out here. Okay, let's get to the deep fields. What do we need exactly? What, like, what are the vegetables that we're grabbing from here? Vegetables from here we're gonna grab is pumpkin, cabbage. We're gonna use the outer leaves okay. to protect the vegetables, and then we'll steam the hearts as well. Just a little cabbage diaper. Exactly. Keep everyone safe. Kumara, sweet potato. Sweet potato. And potatoes. Why don't you have Maori names for everything else? Just, just the, the sweet the potatoes <laughs> got the old one, eh? Yeah, just the one. <laughs> get those kamoras. Kamoras are the MMA thing, yeah. I don't want to MMA. <laughs> Let's go get some yams. You think that's enough? Yeah, that's heaps. No one's going to be hungry tonight. Yeah, we've got a good bounty there, mate. So what's it called when we got to give the money? It's called a koha box. Koha. It's like one of the most important things in Maori culture. It's the way our whole life was started. It was through koha, which means from coming from aroha, which means love. So there's no actual price for this. You only give what you think it's worth. This is 20 bucks or 40 bucks? I like 20 or 30 bucks. I got 40 bucks. I got no change. Yeah. Let's throw in 40. 40 big clams. There it goes. Positivity, prosperity. Koha. Poha. Meat wise, we're going to have pork, chicken, and then uh, lamb. And I'm going to take to a sheep farm after this. Oh, sick. Get amongst the lambs there. New Zealand, known for the lamb. Yeah, more lambs than people. That's why I love New Zealand. <laughs> love a lamb. <laughs> All right, let's head it. Hey there. Good morning. Hey guys. Originally, this all used to be Maori land, but these days it belongs to the sheep. 
brought to New Zealand by the British. For over a hundred years, sheep were the country's most important agricultural industry. That dynasty ended in the 1980s and has since been on the decline. In its heyday, there were more than 70 million of those woolly fluff balls running around. The sheep farming industry is dying a death here. It's a very small industry now. Yeah. yeah. Compared to what it was. It was a massive. It was a massive industry. Massive, massive. Yeah, yeah. It was, it trend, was trendy in trend Canada in the 90s. It's not now. I'm really interested to see if I can make it work right. organically on hill country like this. Let's do a little bit of farming. So this is the best viewpoint from the farm. This is beyond epic. Where was the Maori? All the flatland down here would have been tenanted by Maori. Behind us here, we've got the fighting pa, Hakakino. Hakakino? Hakakino. Okay. So when you were attacked from, from the sea, yeah. you took off up the valley yeah. and defended your position up there. Just full guerrilla warfare there, you know, like trenches and like traps. Yeah, Maori. Constantly just kicking ass. Just protecting, you know? Just protecting. Pleasure. We'll see you in Canada. We'll see. You gotta come! Yeah! <laughs> Beautiful! Yeah. Stuff like this, kinda. Okay. <laughs> Hungy time. Hit it, Ollie. <laughs> Ollie! <laughs> Can't see you, <it>, mate. <laughs> it's Hungy time! The hungi, which dates back to the 13th century, is the traditional way the Maori people prepare food for large family gatherings. Usually, the meat and vegetables are placed in baskets over hot stones at the bottom of a large pit. But due to a fire ban, the hungi's happening above ground. I'm pumped to meet Morgan's family and get a taste of what the hungi is all about. Kia ora, everyone. Kia ora. Kia ora. <laughs> that is my sister, Shana. Hey, nice to meet you. How are you? Des? Des? So I'm hungry, man. How are you? We got some vegetables for you. We went and picked them at a very oh, nice awesome. auntie's garden. You guys auntie's know garden. auntie's? Yes. All right, so how can we help? Well, we got meat and chicken to cut up. Yeah. The way to do it is you okay, one. salt your crackle first. Oh, okay. Empty. Salt's good. Your pork always goes on the bottom of, okay. the, of the steamer. Is this usually done with the whole family? The uh, meat's traditionally done by men. And then is it always traditionally like lamb, pork, chicken? Is yes. there ever like beef, like short ribs yep. or anything like that? Yep. Yeah. Uh, eels. Eels, okay, yes. cool. Do you guys go to Auntie's garden often and like use that cohog kind of uh, paying system as a, it's a pretty trusting uh, system, yeah. right? Yeah. You know how many tattoos I've gotten from tattoo artists coming in? Yeah. Give them a big steak, some few beers. Cheers. <laughs> Is that American barbing? We just call it tradesies. Tradesies. <laughs> tradesies. Mm. So sweet. Look at this. Hi. Is this your first hungy? It's my first hungy. Yes. You're away, you're missing your baby. You come to a hungy, they got a few extra babies lying around. Oh, uh, yeah. You get to hang out with the new baby. We're at the hungy, and we got pumpkin and mutton, and we're gonna smoke it, cause we can't cook in the ground, cause there's a fire ban, and we don't wanna burn down our own community. Yay, what a great Yay. song. That was a good song, was that nice? That's the first original Hungy song. Oh, big future. So we got the cathedral of meat ready. We got the pork belly skin on, down. We got the cabbage leaves. Then we got it layered up. We got the lamb, chicken. And each layer of that is gonna drip down, get beautiful. The chicken's going on the mutton, the mutton and the chicken's going on the pork. And then we got the vegetables going in the other, what do you, what do you call that? I keep calling it like apparatus. What is that? What do you, is there a name for that? Well, I call it a umu. A, a humu? A umu. Umu? Yeah. Umu? Steamer. Well, we're gonna be cooking in the umu today. It's a Maori steamer. Should we get this going? Yeah. yeah. All right, Still so the up. meat's done. Let's start a little smoke fire. It's is that wood prepared. chips? Yeah, that's manuka sodas. Gets the ground taste, gets the hangi taste. Have you soaked these chips at all? No. No? Dry. Okay. They're dry. dry, yeah. So do you leave it on high the whole time or do you turn it down? High the whole time. Just smoking it? For an hour and then down. Just hangi style. Just smoke. Smoke. <laughs> it's distinctive flavor. Boom. Well, Tin Man. It's a beautiful thing. Stack your meats. <laughs> Now that the food was cooking, we had some time to kill. I wanted to learn more about what a hungi is and why the Maori have them. So I know that like me being here is a massive occasion, so that's why we're having a hungi. 
to feed all these people, it all is done by the hangi. The hangi can feed, you can put one hangi down and it'll feed 300 people just like that. Do you guys find that in like Maori culture that it is still very divided? Like certain women can't do man jobs and men do whatever they want. When Christianity come, you know, man, man is this and the woman. Yeah, right. And it changed our culture. We used to be chieftainess woman, but yeah. then when the Christianity come and changed it all. Everything was equal. Yes, yes. You guys would fight, all help. You guys would fight yeah. each, yeah. beside each other, yeah. cook beside yeah. each other. Yeah. And then when Christianity came, they assimilate you guys to how yes. they believe. Yeah. White men, eh? We yeah. <laughs> Can you sing it? Sing a song. Sing a song, please. I'll mean the world to me. So it's been about three and a half hours. You know, we're hanging with the family. Kids are jumping in the pool. I'm on the trampoline. We're having the best time of our lives. Now, we get the big reveal, right? Okay, here we go. Buddy. So you have your chicken here, yep. your mutton here, and your pork. That's beautiful. I'll hire you in my kitchen any day. <laughs> yeah, thumb to thumb. That's how you know you're really good buddies. Ehiwa matukai. Heona mumato tino. Onai oki mumato waira. Let's eat. <laughs> to give me more insight into the Maori long standing connection to their land, Morgan's taking me to Hell's Gate, historically a place for healing and cooking. This area is another example of how the colonizing influence has had an impact on the traditional culture. It's a beauty spot, right? Welcome to Tikitere Hell's Gate, Rotorua's most active geothermal reserve. Why is it called Hell's Gate? Like, it seems like it's not the nicest name. And I can see the reference of it, it being hot, but it's like, you know, this is a beautiful place. Yeah. Well, locally it is called Tikitere. Okay. However, a famous playwright, George Bernard Shaw, when he arrived here, he thought he was walking through the gates of hell. Oh. So today it is well known as Hell's Gate. Fair enough. Yeah. We're in Hell's Gates Gate. Gates of Hell. You're Gates at Hell's of Gate. Hell. Gates of Hell. <laughs> Let's see some, some pools, little springs, a little hot action, a little Hell's yeah. Gate. Back. This is amazing. This is the hottest one. It seems very steamy. The steam that you do see here is called Putane Tane. When our warriors would go out on raids or battles, they'll just look out for the steam of Putane Tane and find their way back here. The tribe from Rotorua were very lucky to come across this yeah. uh, land here before any of the other tribes. Yeah, it's very valuable, right? Yeah, very valuable. Very, very valuable, this land. This is almost like the North Star. Better. Yeah. <laughs> I like Rachel's best, Rachel. man. I'm like, how's the star? And she's like, no. Better. What are some of the other advantages and uses of the geothermal pools? Uh, we do have our cooking pool here, which we call uh, Kaingafa. So we have our Māori warrior pool waiting for you there to give you a taste of a couple of our native food as well as our uh, food that we have today. Can't wait. We're going to go cook in some thermal pools with a warrior. warrior Can't wait pool. to meet this warrior. <laughs> you can really see who Paul is on the inside, right? We're talking about the clothes. We got the business casual, we got the, the beautiful Italian hand leather made shoes here. We got the Pierre, Pierre Cardin, Cardin. The little Pierre me, Cardin bro. belt. Woo! Are you ready to eat? This is our traditional way of cooking. It's called kainafa. Kainafa. That's right. And this is how we cook our food here at uh, Hell's Gate. As you can imagine, back in the in the day when, when the Māoris were living here and they come from Hawaii Nui in their grass skirts, they were freezing in New Zealand and they turned up at a place like this, bro, and they were like, we have found heaven. Yeah. So Hell. Hell's Gate, we found Hell's Gate, not heaven. Each basket, we kind of got something going in each one, or? We've got a bit of a mix going on here. We've got some kumara. Sweet potato. Sweet potato, that's right, yeah. And some corn. Uh, we've also got our prawns, mussels, and a bit of venison sausages in there for the boys. Oh, a little boiled venison sausage. <laughs> Let's eat, Paul. Oh, this one's the mussels. These mussels are huge. These are babies, bro. 
These are baby mussels? These are babies. Where are these mussels coming from? So these particular ones here are actually from the Coromandel. I've got an uncle in the Coromandel in um, Thames that who's got a mussel farm. Ah, oh, nice. Yep, these may be his, bro. Yeah, it could <laughs> be. They could be. Could be Fabian's. It's crazy because like, the smell is sulfuric, but the taste is unbelievable. As you'll see, this pool here is quite black compared to this one over here. Right. So if we were to cook our food in the yellow looking pools, that means they've got a lot of sulfur in them. So we're gonna get that sulfury taste. But when you see the darker, blacker pools, it means they're, they've got more of a oxide in them. Okay. And, and we don't have to worry about that sulfur mm. taste so much. So that's why this yeah, pool's This one's good. So the darker, the better. Darker. Or for cooking, sulfur. Good. Yellow, cooking, bad. How long have the Maori been using this as a cooking technique? So they've used it since they've been living in this area here, and it was 700 years ago. It's amazing that they've, they're like, this is hot, we got a bunch of food. Let's make some baskets. Let's dunk it, yeah. let's make some baskets. And, like, that's a pretty ingenious thing to do, you know? That's Hell's Gate, mate. We've got it down to a fine art. This is a beautiful meal. Right. Let's go hit some mud. One thing left Slide to do. Slide into the old mud pool. Get healed. A couple big dogs about to go dip in some mud. Unbelievable, we have the mud. It's gonna heal the inside, which will make the outside stronger. And the outside, being as strong as it can be, will make the inside stronger. Do you mind if I do your back? Oh. Oh. Let's get under there. This is nice. Oh. What's next out here in New Zealand? What, what, what's going on, you know? We're gonna get to a tamaku. A Maori? Yeah, a little Maori, little Maori tattoo. tattoo? Yeah. Okay. How do you feel about that? We'll see. Let's do it. So, Matty, we're here with Hida, and I wanted you to see, you know, you should get a moko. Tau moko is a Maori tattoo, and the Maori have been getting tattooed for centuries. The design was originally chiseled with bone, which left ridges on the skin surface, historically a sign of status. Tau moko was once reserved for the most high-ranking men and women in the tribe. Most of the time, moko is, is to represent family mm. or genealogy. Uh, it's information, so when people look at your muko, they should be able to tell where you're from. Okay. So if you're ready, we'll come around the back here and yeah. we'll start drawing. Okay. Sure. I don't have much space, so we'll have to find <laughs> a little cute spot. First of all, what do you want to represent? You know, I got an, a son, MacArthur, so I think putting my wife in there. My parents, I have uh, two brothers and a sister. I had a heart attack yep. a few years ago. I have something represent coming out with a new kind of light. Yep. I stopped uh, doing drugs and alcohol about three and a half years ago now. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, me too. All right, so this bottom kuru that we've got at the bottom there, that's your wife. And just above that, that'll be your son. That's the Manaya. Ready? Yeah, buddy. I'm eating food. Getting a Maori tattoo. I love my life right now. It's beautiful, man. It's really cool. That's so sick. It's really an honor, you know, to come here and let Morgan bring me here yeah, and cool. uh, get something that means so much to me yeah. and for somebody to be able to tell that story. You're one of us now. <laughs> yeah, you are, you are. I mean, we're brothers. We're brothers. <laughs> All right, sore leg, let's go. <laughs> for our final meal, I wanted to have another traditional Maori experience. So Morgan took me to harvest mussels with his uncle Fabian on a mussel barge. The Maori have been harvesting and eating local green shell mussels for over 500 years. These days, mussels are a big industry here in New Zealand, employing more than 3,000 people and bringing in over $250 million every year. Fabian's been in the mussel biz since 1990, and in 2000, started his own company, Mussel Madness which calls upon his Maori background and years of seafood experience. How long have you been in the mussel business? Well, you know, essentially we start diving as kids for mussels, as young Maori kids and stuff like that. Right. And as I got older, I've always been involved in aquaculture. So Morgie was telling me you make a pretty mean uh, mussel fritter. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Should we have a wee bit of a cook-up at Aimo? Yeah. Oh. Let's go get a cook-up. Yeah. We're going to go eat some fritters. Uncle Fabian's legend. New Zealand, number one nature, baby. Oh, yeah, mama. Look at this. Just a couple big dogs, gonna eat 300 oysters each. 
So we went out on the muscle bars this morning, came back with a lot of muscles. Fabian's sons were out having a good time, caught a big old fish, gave it to us. We got oysters. We're out here at the batch. So now we get to cook, make a little ceviche, maybe roast it whole. Here you go, Morgie. Over here on the griddle, bro. I'm gonna throw a bunch of butter on this. Fabian, what do you got there? Oh, I just whipped up a few uh, coriander mussel for this. All I done, guys, was just made a beer batter, threw a few eggs in it, topped up some onions, some fresh raw mussels from the harvest today, and uh, some tomatoes. Fritters aren't exactly old school Maori, but Fabian has them down to a science. With the hungi, Morgan and his family use new ingredients in an old way. But Fabian's done the opposite, taking a traditional Maori food and giving it a modern twist. I want this fritter. I want the fritter. I'm going to dip some of that in your butter, man. Yeah, mm. that's the good stuff right there. Mm, they're good. I can eat a lot of these fritters. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Mate, I hope you've had a really good week this week. It's really amazing to see like where you've come from and what you've achieved and how strong the family and the Maori traditions are still alive. In all my experiences with Morgan over the last few days, it's been awesome to see how vibrant and pervasive the Maori culture remains, even after more than 200 years of colonization. Some of their tools and ingredients have changed, but the meaning and heart behind everything they do remains strong. The Maori ability to incorporate these new influences and make them their own comes from a powerful sense of who they are and their unbroken connection to their land. New Zealand, the best island. <laughs> <laughs> really unbeatable.